green lights on, which means the live streamers are now tuning in. So hello. And um, a few questions are coming along. <laughs> so here we go. Benchanda, I was thinking about the Sutta class and the question about living alone, and you don't want to tell it. If you have a cat or a dog, you're not lying. You're living with your partner, the love of your life, or your flatmate. Just make sure you call it George or something in case they ask. <laughs> okay, so there we go. There's a, a little um, clause that you could try. Whoops, they might have claws also. Um, <laughs> you could even call it. Jaws, I don't know, call it something scary. <laughs> but um, we were just discussing this actually here and um, we we're thinking, yeah, you know, you might be able to sort of do this kind of thing as a temporary measure, but in the long term, maybe another solution has to be found. And I'm not exactly sure what that is, but it could be calling out the harassment. It could also be if it's at a workplace and you're really getting. And there's nothing you can do. It's not your fault, right? So they need to be the ones to account for their behavior, first of all. But if really there's nothing you can do, and that would be just traumatic, and you'd be likely to, I don't know, get yourself in an even more difficult situation, sometimes you have to leave the situation. Anyway, I don't know if you have anything more to on those That's okay. bending things. Okay. So the next question living in our western society in which we have to work to earn our living and acquire a home in order to house oneself and a spouse and children it is hard not to crave a better paid job or better advantages for our family to follow a buddhist path should we strive not to pursue these things even though our family needs us to acquire these things it seems easier to follow the buddhist path as a monk or a nun without paid work without possessions or a spouse or children. Is it possible to really live the Buddhist path if we must live within the Western context? Can we ever reach Nibbana if we are living a regular Western life? There's many different types of Western lifestyles, and some people decide you know, not to have children. And some people decide even not to be married, to live by themselves. Some people decide you know, to... Well, they don't decide, but the marriage falls apart and they're single. There's many different parts of the Western um, system. And one of the things which I am very happy about in the Western system, at last, especially women, don't think they have to get married. So and you may get a lot of pressure from your parents, you must get married, why aren't you married? But you have that choice, which is wonderful, to stay single. And if you do stay single, it is obviously a little bit cheaper uh, to live a life. And you, know, you don't have to, you know, if you're a woman, you don't have to spend so much money on fancy clothes and uh, makeup and stuff. It's much more simple in your lifestyle. And also, you don't need big houses. That is something which you know, I don't know why people do buy big houses to stay in. There was a story about this uh, lady who won the lottery in England. I think it was something like £42 million. And you know, with that amount of money, she bought a nice mansion, first of all, in Sussex. And then you know, she was living in the mansion with her husband and two children for one year. And then she sold it. She sold the loss and bought a very small house in some town somewhere in the UK. And when they asked, why did you have this huge mansion and you suddenly sold it? And she said, well, it was a big mansion, but it was tearing apart my family. I never saw anybody. You know, my husband was in one wing of the house. My son was in another part of the house. My daughter was in somewhere else. You hardly ever saw your family. And she said that what I thought was to improve was actually I think many of you can relate to that especially if you grew up in a small place I was in a small council flat and so you'd always see your brother you know slept in the same room with him you know for all my years of growing up and your mother and father you'd always see them and that was like how we learned how to tolerate one another and to love one another 
And so you don't need uh, to acquire a big home or a big house and lots of stuff. One thing which you can learn in the Buddhist lifestyle is to have a small place. You can only be in one room at a time. And when I've gone to places like Sydney, you find in the center of that city that sometimes people don't even have a kitchen house. They just have you know, a study and a, a place to sleep. If they want any food, they just go down to the ground floor. And there's so many restaurants in that uh, street. And the restaurants cook much more delicious food than they can ever uh, cook. And they can just wake up in the morning and decide what they want to eat instead of just having all this food and think, well, I, this is what I'll plan to eat tomorrow. So in some parts of our modern Western lifestyle, which can make life a little bit more simpler. And if you have a big house, it's just to impress to others. Just look at me, I've got a big house. You don't need a big house, small house, and even without a kitchen. And you can go and get your breakfast, your lunch, in the shops outside. That's more expensive. It's actually cheaper. When you start to think of how much no. money you're saving from washing up, from buying, and the cooker, and the cleaner, and everything else. We mean saying no. <laughs> I don't believe that. You think when if you have a kitchen, people are always renovating it. Well. And the electricity, that's all paid for downstairs in the, um, the shops. Yeah. It's certainly much simpler. You have a smaller house, which means less uh, rates or rents. It makes so much more sense to me. You do get better food. <clears throat> <laughs> okay. Can I just say that I think it's possible to work toward a better job if you wish one without craving for one and um advantages for the family you don't have to be material just as Ajahn Brahm was saying so yeah I mean definitely simplicity and even as a monastic it depends on the position you're in but in my case I have to work really hard and I mean really hard so um you know it's how we do our work rather than how much of it we do I think as well Anyway, but I think it's cheaper to cook and much more delicious. That's healthier. <laughs> that's healthier. <laughs> anyway, um, suppose a person in pension age, for example, 65, feels that the secular life is too much of a disturbance in order to walk the path and wants to join a monastery. Can the monastic community accept the elderly to join as they might perhaps turn into a burden due to sickness? <laughs> It is definitely better to ordain when you're young if you can, <laughs> simply because the monastic life is also a kind of um, vocation. And at least in the West, being a monastic requires one to contribute quite a lot to the monastery one lives in. So you're part of a community and you have certain duties to perform. And in the case of new monasteries like my own, Definitely, it would be difficult to have older people who I would then be basically looking after. They may also have incredible qualities and ways that they can look after me. And I wouldn't rule it out completely. But you have to think of it like a vacation because the monastic training actually takes about five to seven years to complete. And then obviously you want to be able to uh, train people that will then become Dhamma teachers as well and will be able to contribute by spreading the Dhamma. So in the West, unfortunately, even monasteries cost a lot of money to run. I mean, they're no different from houses, right? If you live in a house, you have the same council tax, you have the same, you know, electricity and everything else. So there are real life um, things to consider and jobs to be done. However, if you would go to a Buddhist country where there are lots of monasteries, lots and lots of support, <clears throat> and uh, Buddhism is understood in that society, then it's much easier. Or even if you go to a big monastery like Ajahn Brahm has, he does ordain some people around 60, don't you? A few, but in proportion yeah. to the other community members. So there always has to be like a balance of ages. 
just like in any kind of community, in any job, you know, if all the teachers in a school were like 70 and they were all about to retire, you wouldn't really get a lot of, you know, um, possibility for them to develop in their role and for them to kind of make that relationship with the students over a long period of time. So you'd have to have a balance. Um, so where there's a lot of younger monastics, then of course the community, if it's well supported, might be able to take a few older monastics. But generally speaking, um, life in the West as a monastic is quite an energetic job. And, you know, even to have energy for meditation, if you're doing a lot of meditation, um, it's good to start young. But uh, yeah, I think you can simplify and you can live something similar to a monastic life at home. Um, and you might be lucky to find the odd place that would accept. I don't know. Does that sound too negative? Yeah, no, it's usually that I don't choose uh, who I ordain. It has to be the local community there. So all the monks have to agree if they're going to uh, ordain another monk. So what usually happens is they stay there for a while. We get to know them. It's usually like you know, at least a year, and then I think about three or four months. I think as an anagaric, as not as long as anagarica, just as a visitor, and then they stay for one year as an anagarica. That's you know, keeping the eight precepts, and then another year as a novice keeping ten precepts. And you can't really um, take a shortcut, as that's unfair on all the other months being there. And you know, sometimes that if you have done a lot for the community before, such as you know, you have been a secretary of the organization, or you've been a treasurer of the organization or something, you've helped out a lot. And of course, we'll see that from gratitude for it. And you're more likely to be a member of that community and be able to uh, yeah. ordain. It depends on most things, but usually. Now, if you're in your 60s, it's extremely difficult mm. to be accepted. It's not impossible, but extremely difficult. Whilst I really enjoy residential treats, would Anukampa consider options to join future retreats via Zoom? If unable to attend to family commitments, please. Love Anukampa retreats. Wonderful. I'm sure we can do some Zoom retreats. I, I doubt that there'll never be Zoom retreats, but we definitely are in deficit for some residentials. And I really, you know, one of the main purposes of all these retreats is not just to give retreats to the lay community. It's to build a lasting, stable monastic community around a monastic community. So one of the important things there is that we actually meet each other in person um, and we actually have a place that you can come and you can have fulfilling and enriching relationships real relationships with people face to face because that's a much better way to practice the whole path you have spiritual companions with whom you can practice right speech for example so I think residential retreats are really ideal on the other hand I was thinking to myself that even on a residential if we could only get a smaller venue it's possible that we could also have some people join by zoom and that way we could actually reach out to more people because I also understand it's important for people with maybe mobility issues or people who you know can't actually get to a full-time retreat for one reason or another so we'll always try to cater for people the best way we possibly can and provide as many opportunities as we can. But I think at this point in the project also, it's about building up the monastic sangha and building a community around us because unless the monastics, the teachers are fed, it's impossible to perform our work and all the work that goes into organizing these retreats and, um, and you know, continue supporting a big community like this. So we have to find the balance. But obviously, our charitable aims are to spread the Dhamma as widely as we can and make it as accessible as possible. So, yes, all this will be considered. <laughs> so, dear Ajahn, I would like to ask why the Buddha established only a fourfold assembly. Why didn't he include branches for third gender monastics and third gender lay Buddhists? Mm -hmm. It's uh, at the time that it was wonderful to be able to establish places for females. And you know, even then, in those days, that was an amazing thing which the Buddha did. When it comes to the third gender monastics, 
that is not a problem at all because uh, if basically they look male then they join the monks monasteries if they look female they join the female monasteries and so over many years now i have ordained many people who were gay and they were well-known gay people in the community and they became monks as long as they could keep their precepts then they were accepted and so that's i'm very happy with some of the uh, people who i have ordained who were gay even there were some people not just by their gender but also by their even health issues there was one person i ordained and he was a clinical schizophrenic but he was one of the amazing uh, people who he really was enough he was mindful enough he could actually see when he wasn't taking the correct meditation medication or just taking too much medication and it was just such an impressive uh and agarica when he was keeping a precepts i gave him full ordination as a monk even though he's a clinical schizophrenic and he's never caused any problem at all and he's a wonderful asset to the community so a lot of times uh, we don't judge a person you know, on their mental health or their physical health or their gender. Just recently, there was somebody who asked, what about transgender people? Can we ordain them? And so I said yes. And the community of monks, we all said yes. I said yes, of course we can. That's very good, Ajahn. Yeah. But I can't question the Buddha. He only mentioned the four-fold assembly. But we can always fit people in somewhere. Yeah. We have to adapt yeah. to the current need. Indeed. Dear Ajahn, and Ven, Ajahn said today, an enlightened being can't be angry, but can there be anger and nobody who has it? I remember in a sutta that the Buddha was not content with his monks sometimes because of a quarrel. He was a little bit upset and went into the forest for meditation alone. Thanks for the wonderful, powerful days. So I would imagine <laughs> that the Buddha went away to make a point to his monks out of compassion for them, uh, knowing that this would be a little bit of a wake-up call, that they were behaving in ways that weren't pleasing to him and that weren't going to get them liberated, basically. And he'd already tried to reason with them and to get them to see their faults and to, like, stop arguing. So in the end, he just went away. So it was actually a peaceful kind of demonstration, you could say. It wasn't out of anger. It was out of kindness and compassion. So just because you don't have anger doesn't mean you can't take strong action or refuse to act also. It can happen out of compassion. And this is one of the things I often find when people ask about anger and almost wonder whether it's possible to be that engaged in life or really, um, you know, kind of push for change. And maybe it's because we don't really understand the power of things like compassion and bold compassion. In Tibetan Buddhism, they call it fierce compassion, which to me sounds a bit violent, but it means kind of uh, the kind of compassion that doesn't back down and is very strong and um, convinced of itself in a sense. Like, you know you're doing it out of compassion, even though it seems a little bit harsh, like a mother would kind of yank a child away from a fire. You know, it might seem almost aggressive, but of course there's no ill will. There's actually the opposite. It's a protective quality. So, yeah, an, an enlightened being can't be angry because if there's nobody to to have the anger then there's nothing to get angry about i mean <laughs> something that doesn't exist can't be angry so when there's no sense of self there's nothing really to fuel the anger or, or greed i mean if there's no one there what are you craving for what are you angry about it's just five candles coming and going so you know they're going to pass there's no room for anger there at all. So, I mean, I do think that I've met people <laughs> who I have never seen angry. Um, and, yeah, I think it's very possible. The Buddha said it's possible. And um, at the third stage of enlightenment, then there is no more anger, no more greed. Anything to add to that? No, I've never seen people who are angry 
um, achieve anything except for making the situation worse. I don't think it's uh, a very good response. You want to do this? Okay. Can you share some ways one can access encouragement and strengthening faith after breaking some precepts or virtues in difficult times and feeling the karmic effects of this? Though I can connect with my goodness, there's also a feeling of spiritual regression, which feels deflating. Well, actually, you may feel spiritual repression regression. or regression, but it's usually every time if you do make a mistake or you do break a precept, that we learn. Now, this is what I learned as a school teacher. You know, if somebody kid makes a mistake in school, they're learning, for goodness sake. And so you don't punish them. I never could punish a kid at school when I was a school teacher. Instead, you encourage them to do better next time. And when you encourage a kid to do better next time, they're not afraid of you. And you can actually help them much better that way. A good example of that is that story of this um, he was an Australian man who came to train as an eight precept, eventually to become a monk in Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth. And one morning he came to me and he said, I need to talk to you urgently. I haven't slept all night. I broke one of the eight precepts. And he said, which one was it? Did you kill somebody? He said, no. He said, I... I ate in the evening. I was hungry at night time, and I went into the kitchen and I made myself a sandwich and I ate it, he said. He felt so guilty. And I said, okay, thank you for having the courage to admit it. Now you've admitted your mistake. Uh, please, there's other things. Eat more for lunch. There's other things you can eat instead of making yourself a sandwich. In fact, there's all sorts of things. There's chocolate, there's cheese, there's apple juice, there's a cup of tea, there's honey. There's heaps of stuff you can have. And I said, I'll just let you know that. Now you can go. And the next thing he said to me, he said, aren't you going to punish me? I said, no, we don't do punishment in Buddhism. He said, but you have to, because I know my character. If you don't punish me, it will mean I'll do it again for sure. A very difficult case. So then I told him, he said, okay, I've just been reading a book about the history of Australia. I said, the Australian traditional punishment, if they caught any prisoner doing anything wrong, was to give them uh, strokes of the cat. So I'll give you 50 strokes of the cat. You know what that used to mean? That was like whipping them. At the 90 Yeah. And so this young man, you know, <laughs> his face went whiter than the clothes he was wearing. And then I explained to him what 50 strokes of the cat means in a Buddhist monastery. We had two cats at that time. I said, find one of those cats and just stroke it 50 times. That's called 50 strokes of the cat. Learn some kindness. And when you strengthen the compassion, the kindness, then you get more encouragement, <clears throat> encouragement for yourself and less sense of blame. This is not a path which punishes people, which allows you to make mistakes. And then you find you make many less mistakes, but you're not so afraid. If you make a mistake, learn from it. That's all. Mm. No punishment. And then you find that's growth. That's how the Buddha taught. Admitting your mistakes, forgiving them, and learning. That's growth mm. in the Buddha's path. Plus, if you get the chance to retake those precepts, <laughs> uh, then you can. I'm just saying that because I think they might have an opportunity. <laughs> And yeah, again, to remember their trainings, right? They're not like rules, they're tra trainings. So you can connect with your goodness, which is very good. So just keep connecting with that. 
and then those other feelings will fade. And, you know, it's a difficult time, so it's not the norm. So give yourself a break. Dear Adrian Brown and Venerable Chanda, thank you very much for the great retreat. Although I have a hard time understanding English, I'm deeply inspired. A lot of pressure was taken away from me in meditation and replaced with lightness. The meditation became more spacious and full of light. The vastness that comes from the heart is wonderful. Neither my body nor my mind has ever experienced so much kindfulness before. It has evoked so much compassion for myself and other beings, and the joy and trust in the practice is strengthened. New windows have been opened for deeper understandings. I feel very great gratitude, warmest thanks, and greetings are much meta. Amazing. For someone who doesn't speak English, that is so beautifully written. <laughs> or has a hard time understanding it. That's very beautifully written. So well done. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to answer this one. Dear Ajahn, are lay people allowed to stay at your monastery in Perth for a couple of nights, for example? Is it open all day long? Yes, you are allowed to stay overnight or sometimes many nights. And we do have a guest monk. And you email the guest monk, uh, guest monk of Bodhinyana, something, I forget now. Nibuto. Yeah, it's a Venable Nibuto, but that's you know, oh. the, the, the um, what's it called? That's the place you got to email. And oh. it unfortunately does get popular. And because of its popularity, sometimes it gets full. But we also have our retreat center, which is opposite the monastery. When there's a retreat on there, this is the thing which I built. I made sure there was a 60 room retreat center. It'd be wonderful if I could have brought that retreat center with me to England and uh, put it next to uh, this place, because it's a beautiful place. There's 60 rooms and each room has its own ensuite. And we have a big meditation hall, a beautiful kitchen, and lovely grounds. And so this is, you know, what I thought a Buddhist monastery should be like. And so that we have them over there. And when there's not an organized retreat on, people come and do what they call self-retreats, which means that they just uh, uh, go there and they stay there. They keep quiet. Uh, they just you know, take the eight precepts and live there and have a wonderful time. So, yes, we do. Be wonderful in the future, you know, when uh, Ayachanda gets more, um, more help, especially with the admin work, that maybe we, this will happen over here in UK, have a big monastery where people can actually um, stay. What we had to be very careful of is at first we had a monastery and unfortunately many of the lay people, you know, who supported us built upon the monks as janitors. So, you know, to make sure everything was done for them. It was weird, but we were kind. But now, you know, we have this retreat center and it's much easier that people can come. They have to look after themselves. So. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do this one? Okay. Excellent retreat. Please excuse me for my, I'm not going to say silly because there's no such things as silly questions. Every question should be respected. When I am watching my breath, slowly it becomes subtle and disappears. Wonderful. Once it happens, I divert my attention to my mind and look for any thoughts coming in. Then soon breathing reappears. Do you think looking for thoughts making me restless? Yes. And hence breathing reappears. Please let me know what would have been the correct way. May I take this opportunity to wish Ajahn a venerable chanda a long and have healthy life? And you can't have both. Which one would you like me to have? A long life or a healthy life? <laughs> I'll have both. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> With Meta. Okay. Yeah, it is true that the best thing to do is actually nothing. When you get to those stages of meditation, remember to be a passenger. 
So you don't have to look for any thoughts coming in. You just, whatever you are aware of when the breath disappears, you're still mindful. What are you mindful of? And then you'd be mindful of something like peace. Now, it's just similar that if you're in a well-lit room and you go outside into the garden, which is dark, it takes a while for your eyes to become accustomed to the, the new level of light and be able to see things. And that's the best simile I can give for when you start getting into the deep meditations. Sometimes your breath disappears and there's nothing to see. There is something to be aware of, what you are aware of right now. Yeah. So there is something there and it takes a while for you to get the um, sensitivity of your mind to see what is there when the breath disappears. You don't need to do anything. Dear Ajahn Brahm and Venchanda, I cannot describe how grateful I feel. Please, even if you find the most fantastic place ever, keep the online retreat format for those of who, us who could not make it otherwise. Muchus, muchismus, gracias. Muchismus, muchismus. Muchismus, gracias <laughs> for everything. <laughs> Hope to see you again soon. Aww. Oh. Two monastic colored cats, yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, dear Arjun and Venerable, thank you for sharing your wisdom and great energy you both exude. Big thanks to the support team for making such a wonderful event possible. My mind got tired of asking questions. May all be well. Very good. That clearly means all is well. Shall we read this too? Here you go. Good evening and a huge thanks to Arjun, Ram and Venchanda for their help and support. Thanks. Mm. Today, during one meditation, I was particularly stuck with a severe pain in my chest. So at the end of the meditation, I asked, as suggested by Ajahn Brown, why do I feel pain? And then, what do you want to tell me? Why am I like this? And I saw me very small being beaten by my mother. So I tried the asset trauma approach in Australia, explained last night in the questions, that of the door of my heart is always open for you. Ajahn Brahm and Venchanda were the people who protected me, those inside my heart. It worked. It's working slowly. Oh. Then today, with loving kindness meditation, I cried again. Now I'm sad. Do I have to cry all the tears? In which way I have to carry on next hours and days? Thank you for helping me untie the knots for having a better life. Thank you. I would like the retreat to continue. Yes, so would I. There are many gifts that one really has. Thank you with all my heart. That's so lovely. Yeah. And I think what you said at the end there about thank you for helping me untie the knots, I think that's what's happening with the tears. It's just the knots untying and the tears coming out. Sometimes those tears, before they're cried, they're a kind of tightness or a kind of contraction or defensiveness around the heart. And when that hurt and trauma starts to melt, you know, because you've allowed it in, then it softens and becomes tears. So I think this is a very good sign. I mean, you've done the uh, welcoming of the pain. You've allowed it in. You've seen this very small and vulnerable being being beaten by your mom. And, uh, you know, this is this is a lot of pain that you may have been carrying for a very long time. And I'm sure you've cried other tears, but maybe, you know, they weren't necessarily or knowingly related to that. So now you're directly dealing with some of the pain around that. And to me, it seems quite healing because you've obviously starting to intuit that you're having a better life. So I would say don't expect anything just because that's happened today doesn't mean it'll come tomorrow. Sometimes it has, you know, it paces itself sometimes. Um, so just welcome whatever's coming. And open your heart. And if you feel it's too much at any time, just, you know, open your eyes and maybe put your hand on your chest and wish yourself well. Say some phrases of loving kindness or, you know, just change your practice for a while. Um, but it sounds fine to me. Anything, Ajah? Yeah, just that story of this one guy, an Australian guy. He was young, he was single, and he started crying during the meditation retreat. And he came and asked me, what's going on? And I asked him, when was the last time you cried? And he went silent. He said, I haven't cried for about 15 years. My father, when I was a young teenager, told me, Australian men don't cry. And I said, 
please, you can cry in this retreat. Cry as much as you want because you've got a lot of crying to catch up on. Mm. And he was crying just so often during, <laughs> during the meditation. And the benefit of that, he felt so much better afterwards. And he was a single man, and he got so many offers from the young ladies who were at their retreat <laughs> who wanted to look after him. Oh. <laughs> it was a great cry. <laughs> so anyway, he went away very happy. Excellent. <laughs> You're migrating over there, John. Okay. <laughs> Um, thank you to Ajahn Brahm. Oh, oh, I think it's your turn. Okay. Yeah. Thank you to Ajahn Brahm Venerable for a wonderful retreat. I've been following Ajahn Brahm's teaching since about 2007, when the teachings were only audio online. I enjoyed the jokes very much then and still do. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Even if I've heard them many times before. Look, I remember just you know, even some of the teachings of the Dharma, you've heard it many times before. And even sometimes some of those wonderful movies I used to like, I watched them many times. So there's nothing wrong with hearing them many times. After a while, you see the hidden meaning in them. <laughs> They're that, very deep. Some of them are actually very deep. <laughs> and I, I always mention to everybody, that I've heard my jokes more times than anybody. And they still make me laugh. <laughs> okay. They made me remember the teachings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've been practicing daily meditation, Ajahn Brahm study guided meditation from the recordings online, diligently for the past 15 months, and has helped me with a difficult period still ongoing in life. Thank you both for a memorable retreat. Well done. Thank you for being here. Everyone's thanking us, but you are the retreat. Yeah. There wouldn't be a retreat otherwise. But yes, anyway, we thank everyone. Thank you, Ajahn Brahma Vanchanda and the team for an increasingly peaceful and pleasant week. And can I thank everybody who's listening for being here? Otherwise, just talking to a computer would not work. We need to see you. Yeah. So thank you for being here. And for your lovely smiles. It's so encouraging, you know. That's the only reason I could teach, actually, because I was terrified of ever opening my mouth in public. But then when I started doing it and I saw the lovely smiles and the sincerity and the way people soak it all up, it's just so touching. It really is very touching. It, yeah, anyway. <sighs> Dear Ajahn and Venerable, thank you so much for this week. I'm glad only the people who are grateful are writing it. <laughs> uh, it's been such a wonderful experience. I have to leave to go to work at 9.30 tomorrow, so unfortunately I shall miss the last session. But I hope to meet in person someday. Blessings to you both. Just amazing. Thank you so much. Beautiful. I'm just not reading the names just simply because I don't want in case you prefer us not to. But we are reading you. Dear Ajahn Brahma Venchanda, thank you so much for the amazing retreat, also to the wonderful team for making it possible. The gift of Dhamma is, exceeds all gifts, and your teachings are indeed a very valuable gift. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Likewise, your practice. <laughs> your turn. Dear Ajahn Brahma and Venerable Chanda, listening to early Buddhist teachings was like divine music to my ears. The second part of the retreat starts next week for me when I go back to the corporate world. I've been building a tiny retreat hut in my heart, which I can take with me wherever I go. It's brilliant. <laughs> Just need to close my eyes and arrive there. My heart for gratitude to both for your guidance, kindness and dedication to teaching Dhamma. May you both continue to receive help and support. Yes, I hope that you do. Ben will chanda over you. here. Likewise. And I get Ben and support. I think so, yeah. But from all the beings in every direction to flourish your Dharma services. Hoping to see you both tomorrow oh. in London at the public talk. Lovely. Great. Hi, I often wondered if Guru Rinpoche was a Buddhist teacher when he came to Tibet from India. Ajahn, do you have an opinion on this, please? 
Other than the above question, I just wish to thank both you and Venchanda for your kindness and the volunteers too. Well, there's some questions I could give an opinion on, but it's not an informed opinion. So uh, I don't have enough information on Guru Rinpoche. But he probably was a Buddhist teacher. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. No, I don't either. Dear Ajahn Brown, Today, during the meta meditation, I felt a sort of tingling sensation all over the body, like pins and needles, and it lasted quite a bit. Was that an imitator? If it was an imitator, it was like a coarser type of imitator. If it felt beautiful and pleasant, then well done. Give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Dear Okay, excellent Vihara related questions. <laughs> what about your monastery, Venchanda? Yes, what about my monastery? Do you have any people interested in becoming an on under you? Is that something you're looking forward to? Well, I guess it depends who they are and whether they are interested and whether it's the right time and but yes, definitely, this is the whole aim of the monastery, that we want to build community and give the opportunity for women to ordain. So, of course, it always depends very much. It's a bit like any um, relationship in life. It has to be mutually beneficial and enriching. And sometimes it's very much about... Um, I mean, it sounds funny to say this, but kind of the right fit, because we're talking about spiritual companionship and we're talking about the wholesome qualities growing so as long as that's happening for both people, then it could work. So yes, this is something that will happen in due course, and it can begin by just coming to visit if you, if it is something you incline toward. And sometimes people don't even know that they might have that aspiration unless there are opportunities. So this is another reason for giving those opportunities so that it's actually a possibility in people's minds. Because until I heard about the possibility for bhikkhuni ordination, I just presumed, you know, that I was ordained and I was happy enough. But when you actually have the chance to take the full ordination and you feel that you're really committing to the Buddha's training the way he intended it, and you're joining the Sangha as a fully-fledged member, you know, the global Sangha, because the ordination is universal throughout every, at least, early Buddhist organization, and even Mahayana too, then this really gives a great feeling of refuge and encouragement and inspiration to the practice. So yes, eventually we hope to have more nuns. I cannot do all the teaching on my own, so please come along and help. <laughs> Venerable, are you or will you be at Anukampa Vihara accepting visitors to serve me for several nights regularly or even longer? Yes, please come. I need this. <laughs> it's not only that I accept you, I welcome you. And this is what makes the community actually work. So because I don't know if people know, but bikunis aren't supposed to cook for themselves or shop or obviously if you don't handle money, you can't shop. So we also don't drive. And um, the whole point is that there's this beautiful reciprocal relationship whereby you get the chance to serve and help us with our material needs and requisites, and we get the chance to serve you in the Dhamma. So it becomes a beautiful, hopefully mutually enriching relationship. Um, thank you both for inspiring my practice again. And I'm so glad and happy to have Venerable back with us. And I hope we meet soon. Because this person, I know you, and you come to my groups, but we haven't met. <laughs> Looking, huh? Bristol. Looking forward to seeing you. Hey, Bristol. Hey, Bristol. Yes. Excellent. So we'll see you in Bristol. And hope we're usually quite in a hurry a little bit before and after because of trains. But please come anyway and say hello. We're easy to spot. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Ready? Okay. Here we go. What would the Dharma suggest we do if we have a child or other family member whose speech and actions you find offensive, aggressive, critical, unwholesome, unkind, and you find it hard to be in their presence, even though you know you should help them? You should also help yourself as well. Remember, you're in this as well. Should you just see them with compassion because they lack awareness to such a big extent? When should you pull back and keep away from them because they 
resonate at such a low level that has a bad effect on you? How do you handle this if this is your adult child and you still feel you should help them? Please, I mean, you feel you should help them, but you should help yourself as well. When you have a family, as I've often said, it's not about helping and serving them. It's about helping and serving us, the, the, the two, three, four, five of you all together. And what's best for all of you? And sometimes what's best is actually just moving away, having a break, so you can actually see the situation with a bit of peace. I would, that's the sort of thing which I would advise you to go off on a retreat somewhere for a while to cool off and to get another perspective. But don't help others at the expense of your own health and well being. And sometimes that's, you know, people can change. One of the other things which I would suggest if you are with that person as a close family member, and they're offensive, aggressive, critical, or wholesome and unkind. See if you can just forgive their bad qualities. And every time they say something which is kind and peaceful and you know not the stuff we don't which you don't like, but the stuff which you do like, then make them know that you really respect that. Say thank you for the good speech and actions and behavior. Because what you're doing, you're responding to them, to their good qualities, and you're reinforcing those good qualities. When you get offended by somebody's aggressive and unhelpful qualities, you know, then you're under their control. And that's not a, a healthy thing for either of you. So anyway, that's how it can be handled, but please look after your own health and well-being. If they're so bad, then you have to pull back. And if you have to pull back, I think it might be helpful maybe to you and maybe to them if you could maybe write to them about it in in nonviolent speech, in a nonviolent way, and just talk about yourself and why it's difficult for you. Because this can also give the other person a chance to reflect. Making it clear that you still love them if they're your child. You want to read that one? Okay, let me your hand to Oh, sorry. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Dear Ajahn, the guide, the guided loving kindness meditation was out of this world. It was very alien, wasn't it? I'm only joking, I should joke. The guided loving kindness meditation was out of this world. If it can be taught to school children around the world, I think most world conflicts will disappear within a generation with Meta. Yeah. Especially if it could be taught to the politicians. Yeah. Big school children. Big school that should be sent back to school. Dear yeah. Ajahn Bam and Venchanda, I'm so grateful for being able to participate in this wonderful retreat. Every word of Dhamma I hear from you sinks in very deep into my mind and makes perfect sense. <laughs> deep meditation did not happen yet, but I have confidence that it will. Very good. Thank you for leading us downhill to peace and safety. The kindness and wisdom you radiate brought tears of joy into my eyes every day. I've never felt this peaceful and content. Or oh, I just wanted to to tell you how much I love you. Take the eye out. Take out you. Take out you. And what remains is love. Isn't that beautiful? So it sounds as though your heart is very open and soft. And if the dumb is thinking in every word, that shows you're really ready for this. So you're very much on the path. How wonderful. Do you want to read this one? Dear Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda, Thank you both so much for all your kindness and great wisdom. Thanks to, to the support team. I clearly have much progress to make along the path to achieve stillness and deep meditations. I need to shield so in person. In person. So in person retreats are out of the out for the time being. What suggestions do you have that would allow me to continue to benefit from support along the path? If there's one or two people on this retreat 
of which can be a good friend to you. That would be wonderful. Yes, you have to share some of uh, you know, who you are, what you do. But then there's other people who are just very wonderful people. You make friends with them, just one or two, and they become your Kalyana Mitta, and they become wonderful assets for you. People you can talk to, discuss things with, and that will help and support you a lot. And of course, all of the resources which we have on talks which have been recorded uh, here and other places, you can actually uh, use those to support you as well. Mm. And I will be having Zoom sessions again regularly, so and hopefully getting Ajahn Brahm to do some stuff as well. Um, so once that starts again in December, you're very, very welcome. We do um, Sutta class every Friday, Sutta discussion. And at that time, because it's not like a retreat, you can actually speak <laughs> like with your voice. So it's a lot more intimate and personal in a way, and that's ongoing. So people get to know one another. And we also will have some meta practice some Saturdays every month and um, chanting every Wednesday. We do the loving kindness chanting, usually in Pali and dedications, blessings. So this little group becomes quite a close group. And many of you are here from that group, all our co-hosts and others, many others as well. So that's one resource that you can always tap into any time and you don't have to commit. You can just come in and out as you wish. Um, I guess I can also take suggestions and, you know, as this little community develops, there will be more happening, I hope. So, yes, you will not be left out and we'll try to do some sort of Zoom thing when Ajahn's over. I'll keep that in mind. I'm not quite sure how it would work, but um, even otherwise, during the corona, we did sometimes a one-day Zoom yeah. retreat and I'm sure sure we can keep doing things like that just to keep the pot top top i would also suggest if this sutta discussion resonated with you at all like during this retreat to keep reading and listening to some of the talks uh, by ajahn brahm and ajahn brahmali in particular who are absolutely brilliant at explaining the suttas and you know if you have either this little word of the buddha or any of the tipitaka the majima diga samyutta etc and you can listen to that with Ajahn Brahmali's commentary on that, for example, it's just wonderful. It'll really open out the Buddha's teachings for you. So get hold of those kind of things. Maybe even have yourself a little retreat at home from time to time and choose a teacher or choose a set of teachings and play them. Play this one again. You know, just do it again in your own time somewhere. Why not? And then you can do it whenever you feel you have the time. So, seems we've answered all the questions. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, amazing. Seems like a very happy sadi, sadi, sadi. You have answered all, all the, the questions, questions for now. <laughs>